All right, welcome back to Power Forward. Justin White alongside Mateen Cleaves. Mateen, how you doing, my friend? Oh, Justin, baby, you know it. Feeling good, flying high, it's all good. All right, Mateen, well, I want to kick off today's conversation uh, but by talking about a couple different types of people. And I, and I know that you're going to be able to relate to this, you know, from your, your playing career especially. Uh, you know, the coaches who told you what you needed to hear as opposed to the coaches who told you what you wanted to hear. But when you think about that dynamic and those two very different approaches, what was more valuable for you as a player in terms of those two different approaches? Oh, definitely what I needed to hear. And that goes back from my parents uh, to my teachers to, to the great coaches I had. You know, sometimes you didn't like to hear that at that particular point. But oh boy, oh boy, when the smoke cleared, it's what you needed to hear. So I, I look back on my, my days, my li- just living in general, and I appreciate those folk that told me what I needed to hear opposed to what I wanted to hear. I, I, I thought you were going to answer that way. And, I, and I'm glad to hear that, you know, that it goes, <laughs> it goes beyond basketball. You know, like you said, going back to, to the way you were raised. And it seems like today, you know, uh, you know people, people need a little bit of criticism, especially if you're going to get better. Um, and, and today's guest, I know, is a proponent of that. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome in Steve Hers. He is the president of the Montag Group, a sports and entertainment talent and marketing company out of New York City. He is the founder of IF Management, and he now is also a career advisor to CEOs, lawyers, entrepreneurs, and more. Steve, great to have you with us on Power Forward. Thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be here. Well, let's jump right in with uh, with that thought that Mateen and I were just talking about, because you have a book that you wrote, and, and I love the title, Steve. It's called Don't Take Yes for an Answer. And, you know, in, in researching the book and learning it a little bit about, you know, your I- ideas and, and the messages that you uh, are conveying in this book, it seems like you are a big proponent of people surrounding themselves with critics, essentially, with, with people who are going to tell you, as Mateen and I were just talking about, what you need to hear instead of what you want to hear. Why is that so important to you? Well, it, it, it's it's just, it's funny. I, I've talked a lot about this book, and there's a mindset in sports that Mateen just kind of touched upon that it's expected if you're going to be a player, on, on especially on a high level, as someone like Mateen competed at, that you're going to have a coach who's going to coach you, which includes a lot of criticism, because how are you going to do something better if you don't get that feedback and that critical feedback? I mean, it's not like we grow up and we know exactly how to break a a zone defense or how to break a press or any of the other myriad things that he learned how to do along the way at a very high level. And so the expectation of an athlete is, I want you to coach me. I want you to make me better. And so I think that that should be existing in all of our lives everywhere. Why does it exist in athletics and, and to a large extent in music when you learn how to play the piano or what have you, but it doesn't exist almost anywhere else. And so I think that if you look at people who have excelled in those other fields, the expectation is I, I wanna do this, I wanna get better. I don't wanna hear that I'm already good enough at this. So that's a mindset that I think is very transferable and very important for all of our lives in every aspect of what we do. Now, Steve, let me ask you this now. Were you, um, is that something you always, is that how you always lived your life? Or was that, um, was it taught to you by a parent, uh, an ex-coach, of a friend, or was it, you know, how, how did that come about uh, in your life? It's a good question. I mean, look, I, I had parents that expected a lot out of their children. I'm one of four kids. Everyone in my family went to college and also has a graduate degree and, uh, all all four kids own their own businesses. So my parents instilled a real entrepreneurial spirit in all of us and and, and just an expectation that we were gonna do great things in life. But I don't think they really gave us that much criticism per se. It it was was really more later in life that I learned it. And it wasn't by a coach or or a teacher. It was honestly my observations in business and and, and being an agent, being a talent agent who for the most part represents on-air broadcasters, I was able to observe like, why does one person, you know, soar in this world and another person doesn't when all other things seem to be equal? And I just had this observation that it was those people that really 
insisted on that feedback. They sought it out and they wanted to get better and they pushed themselves to much higher levels. And they really didn't listen to the hype. You know, you know, you, you've been in the business. Like if you, if you get off the set, everyone's going to tell you how great you were. And it's easy to just take that feedback. That's it. Um, but you wouldn't go watch film of a game uh, the next day and have the coach just tell everyone, oh, you were so great. Even if you won by 20 points, I'm sure there are probably two or three things you could have done better during the course of the game that you're going to focus on. And so that was when it all kind of hit me once I got into the business world. You know, you, you bring up an interesting point and Mateen and I can both absolutely relate because, you know, we're, we're both former on-air uh, personalities and, and you're right, you know, especially when you think about the world today and, and how you measure success, um, because everything today is so data driven and, you know, you look at metrics and how someone's performing and are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Well, in your world of television, it, it's so subjective. One person could think you're doing great. And another person could say, and eh, not so much. So you, having done this for, for over two decades, um, evaluating talent and then obviously helping these, these on-air personalities um, get jobs in bigger markets, it seems like you know what you were just talking about um, in, in terms of feedback, um, it kind of lends itself. You know, the, the, the principles in your book are, are very much interwoven through the career that you've had as a talent agent. It is. And, and, you know, you also make a good point, which I try to address, which is this question of subjectivity. You know, if, if, if I don't like someone who has, you know, wears blue shirts or has green eyes, okay, that's subjective. I can't do anything about that if I wear a blue shirt or I have, you know, green eyes. And so what I try to tell people in my book and in my coaching and in my agent world is try to focus on the objective qualities. What objectively, so if you have a deeper voice, you know, nine times out of 10, people are going to find that more authoritative than someone who has a higher pitch voice. If, if you have really good energy and you modulate your energy in a good way, that's objectively going to be a better thing than someone else. If, if you're a good listener and you engender a lot of trust in another person, objectively, that's a good thing to be. It's better to be than not having it. So I, I think we tr I try to focus on those qualities. I think that most of us would agree on are objective and subjective qualities. You can't do anything about them anyway. So you kind of just have to live with them. So now what advice would you have for like a young leader or a young coach or someone that's in position of leading people and they, and, and they just want to be liked, you know, they, they have, a, they, they struggle having those tough conversations when you have to coach someone up, when you have to tell someone, maybe they're not as good as they think they are, or, or they could do better. So what advice would you have for that? Because like everybody wants to be like, everybody wants to be accepted. So if you could advise any of our younger listeners on, you know, how to handle some of those situations, what advice would, would you have for them? I think, first of all, you, you, you have to have a level of trust with someone. It's likability is less important than trust. And I think some, a lot of people make the mistake of they think they that because they're like they're trusted but they're not all often because people can see through that they're like when i'm coaching you it's my need for you to like me which and it shouldn't be about me it should be about you and i think if you can also communicate to the person that you're trying to coach i'm telling you that you need to do this better you can do this better i'm criticizing you not just because i want to hear myself talk or because i know you can be better i know you can do that and this is really about you i'm invested in your growth and yes, if you grow and you get better at this, it's going to help our team, our organization. It's going to help all of us. So we're on the same page rowing that boat. And I think like sometimes, you know, little things go a long way. And, you know, we touched upon this a little bit earlier before the podcast started about your relationship with Tom Izzo. And, um, you know, I think the fact that you know that 20 years after you've played for him, you could still pick up the phone and you do call him or he picks up the phone and calls you. That's a level of trust and that depth of relationship that you have so that if he said to you something, listen, Mateen, in your mortgage business, I noticed this, you could do this better. You'd be much more willing to listen to him because he's established that level of trust. And I think that it's very easy to do that with people if you show them that you care about them. Mateen, you know, I haven't seen you in a while. How's your mom? How's your dad doing? How's your family? Like, how are you doing with work? You know, just to take a genuine interest in someone about their life outside of the four walls of what you might be coaching them. So you know that that person who's coaching you cares about you. That goes a long way. And, and, it, um, 
Sorry, and let sorry. me no 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 I'm sorry to cut you off, but I, I had to jump in on this and, because that's so important. So for our listeners, I hope you paid attention because the you're in a position of leading people. And when you get across to them that you care and it's not all about work, or you know, like you talked about, Stephen, the trust, Coach Izzo's secret sauce is that that's what it is. The trust right. part, he gets us, we know that he cares about us, so we trust him. So whenever he tells me you need to get better at this, well, I need you to do this. I trust that and I do it, you know, so that's the secret sauce. So right. so I'm sorry. I had to jump in on that because I no, hope no, that, it, that did. didn't go past, you know, our listeners ears. No, I'm glad you did it. Look, I, I, I got to know a little bit about UWM in, in talking to Justin earlier in the week. And I know one of your core principles, your first core principle is it's, it's relationships, not transactions. And I think that's really important. And I can see why your business has been so successful just by some of the, the precepts that Justin educated me on. And, and even, you know, f- funny enough, like, you know, I actually need to refinance my, my mortgage and, and share that with Justin. And he really helped me out already in just the three days I've known him now. And so he's proving that I can trust him because he's trying to help me and he's invested in my my needs right now. And of course, I'll look out for him because look, we're reciprocal beings. If somebody shows us that they can be trusted, we, we, we want to do right by them too. It's just a natural impulse. And, and those relationships that you guys were talking about, Steve, I mean, you know, just kind of looking at what you've done over the years. I mean, not only do you have clients who have been with you for over 20 years, you also have people who work for you, who work with you, that have been with you for over 20 years. Is it safe to say that it's the same kind of vibe, you know, your, your clients have been with you that long for the same reason that your colleagues have been with you because of the relationships that you've established in that trust through loyalty that you talked about earlier. You know, I, I like to think so because, you know, the truth is, is that I guess I have a pretty good outlook on money with respect to my life that I, I've done okay. I'm not by any means the wealthiest guy you know, but for my needs, I have a good amount. And you know, I think my employees know that, like, within reason, when 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 things go bad in their life, I'm going to be there for them. Like, I'll be there for them financially and otherwise. And and I think that uh, people people like that. They they like knowing that you're not just going to be there for them on the good times, but you're going to be there for them on the rainy days too. And I've been there for most of my employees when their children were born in the hospital, and you know, signed marriage contracts for several of them. And you know, it's 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 a much and, and this may not be the right relationship for everybody, but I really like feeling like my business is a family. And when you're in a family, like that's a really serious relationship. Like, I, again, I don't want to go back to this, but I, I get the feeling from the little life. I've only met Tom Mizzo a couple of times, but from what I know about him, from what you know, people have said, he treats his former players and his current players like a family. And once you're in that family, you're in the family. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of like real just a, a tremendous sense of safety in that family unit and, and people want to feel safe. And, you know, like I am the one that's in the position to do things for other people, but I know that if push comes to shove, all those people in my life, whether they're employees or, or, or their clients, they're going to be there for me too. Like God forbid something ever happened to me. I, I know there'd be a lot of people there for me. And, and that's a real great sense of safety that we all need. I love your approach, man. And and no surprise uh, that you're having success because it's that approach and that's the winner's approach. Now, now let me ask you this because I have some leaders and and, and, and you like right now, you're in such a, a great space. It seems like you have it all figured out, right? Well, well there, not all, but some. Well, <laughs> well, hey, yeah, I get it. You know, you don't have to brag. Let me brag for you. Okay. But listen, it's some leaders, right? That I'm sure when you first started, did you make any mistakes? Like, like right now, okay, with your experience and, you know, everything, you know, I'm sure it was, you know, some trials and tribulations, but when did you learn that? You know, did, is that something you always knew or did you like not handle a situation so good and then you had to reflect back and say, oh man, I got to do better at that. So um, talk a little bit about, about that. Oh yeah. I mean, look, I, I didn't learn any of this until I was well into my thirties. I, um, you know, I, I struggled a lot. I, I went to law school and um, really didn't do well there. And then it's, it's in the book. I, I, I basically got fired from my first legal job and was told I really wasn't cut out to be a lawyer. And then I moved into the agent business and I struggled there in the beginning as well. I just didn't really feel the values that the companies that I was working for 
were, were things that I wanted. And, you know, I was, I was kind of naive and idealistic, you, you know, like I wanted to create almost like this paradise in, in a business setting and the world's a tough place. And, you know, and so when I started my business, I, I think I wanted to create this idyllic thing and, you know, you got to get lucky. I mean, you know, Justin knows Gideon, who's been with me for over 21 years. He's a really great guy. And we're, we're almost like brothers more than, than colleagues. And, and this woman, Carol, has been with me for 21 years. And a guy named Jeff, who, who uh, Justin knows too, 17 years. So, you know, you just have to really pick the right people that are very, very high in character. And once you have a few of them around you, then other very high quality character people will follow them and they'll wanna be attracted to your business and come work there. And we've been lucky to do that. But there were a lot of trials and tribulations along the way getting to this place. See, it's, it's no coincidence, Mateen, because Steve, so many of the entrepreneurs that we talk to, you know, um, they tell us, something very similar to what you just mentioned. You know, their, their values have to align with those of their business partners. And, and those relationships always seem to lead to the most success. Um, to pivot from that, though, just a little bit, um, you're in a business, you're in a competitive business. There are other talent agencies out there. So you're competing for talent. Um, mm -hmm. Mateen, you're obviously a competitive guy having played professional sports. You have a very interesting strategy, Steve, that you talk about in the book, related to communication and how you can kind of set yourself apart. Um, it's, it's called awe. So it's authority, warmth, and energy. And you, and you kind of refer to these as, as the soft skills that we can all use uh, to, to kind of put ourselves ahead. Ex explain awe for our, for our listeners and why it's so important in a, in a competitive sense. Sure. So, you know, when you think about it, unless you're a basketball player, and there's really a difference. Like if a guy can score 20 points a game and shut down the other point guard and another guy can only score 10 points a game and not shut down the point guard, you know, from a, uh, from a, from a substantive place, there's a real difference between one guy and the other guy. Right. The problem is, is that in business, if you have 10 guys who went to law school or 10 guys who went to business school or 10 guys who went to medical school and you needed, uh, you broke your arm and you needed a, a, an operation or whatever the service is, all those people seem like the same to you. Like they're all commoditized. Like all the doctors seem the same. Probably all the mortgage brokers seem the same, right? And, and we all seem we can get commoditized. So ultimately the things that aren't commoditized in life is the ability for someone to trust you and to like you and want to be around you. And if you can master those qualities, nobody can make you a commodity because once someone has that level of trust in you or that likability that they have and they just want to be around you, and they have that faith that you can do the job for them, then they're not going to look around for anyone else and you're going to get a lot of referrals out of it. So that's what awe basically is. It's this idea of once you're good enough at the hard skills of life, how do you master the soft skills? And I think that the authority is an interesting thing because again, like you can talk to 10 different mortgage brokers and they all might know exactly the same amount. But if you don't speak in a way that's convincing to me, I'm going to hire the next guy even though you may actually have more authority substantively. So how's your voice? How's your body? Are you emotionally committed to your message? Are you making eye contact when you're speaking? Or do you convey a sense of doubt about yourself when you're talking to someone? And if you do that, you're not going to have that stylistic authority and you're not going to win the room. So I think a lot of people lose, you know, metaphorically, or they don't achieve their potential because they might go to the right schools. They might work hard. They might study, do all the right things, but then they lose it because they have a really high pitched voice or they have this bad body language or they make this horrible eye contact or use a lot of filler words. Win the room. I mean, that's, that's right up your alley right there. Oh, it is. And, and I'm glad you mentioned, you, you talked about body language and I had a situation like this, you know, I went to, um, to get a timeshare to look at some timeshares at some point, you know, and the, and I do things I, and maybe I, I, I shouldn't do it, but I do little things. I play little games and, I might not agree with some things that they say, and I might act uninterested just to see how professional that person is going to be. You know, I might want the time show. I might say, ah, I'm going to hold off till next week. And I had a young lady and she, she bombed it. You know, she was, she screwed it up. You know, she was like, she, when I said, I'm, I might kind of wait, or I'm going to look at another one just to make sure. Well, she, I mean, she, went in this whole defense mode and I don't know if you're serious about buying and she just screwed it all up and I ended up getting a timeshare from another guy just because the person he was 
you know, he was professional. He was, you know, pos- positive. He he wasn't pushy, you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I ended up buying one at that point when I really didn't even want to get it. But I bought it from him just because of some of the things, Stephen, that you just talked about. Right, because you're, you're connecting with him. And look, you know, it's, I, I think, Justin, we can use Mateen as a good example of warmth and energy. I mean, you can, for anybody who's watching this podcast or listening to it, the guy just oozes energy. I mean, he just like <laughs> you're, you're 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 so emotionally connected to your message. You're so enthusiastic. I'm excited to hear about this timeshare. You know, I don't know anything <laughs> about it. I just want to know, like, where was this? Why'd you buy from that guy? You got me roped into this story. Because you're so enthusiastic, and and you're also so warm. You smile so much. You're very complimentary. You're easy to talk to. And these are the qualities that people don't realize are so important in their ultimate success. You know, you're smiling a lot, you're laughing, you're, you're, you're easy to be around, you know, and, and I bet you that that podcast guy w- was probably the same way. I mean, I'm not sorry, the, the um, timeshare guy was probably the same way. Steve, yeah. Steve's, ready, Steve's ready to pitch Mateen for some uh, some some broadcast jobs again. Mateen, you may be you may have to get back in the ring. You never know. Um, but but you know you you touched on us. So you, you talked about authority, and, and you were just touching on the other two aspects: warmth and energy. You know, especially as it relates to authority and then warmth, Steve. It, it seems like you know there's there those are two completely different concepts. But like you said, and I, and I want you to kind of talk to our to our entrepreneurs out there because they are out there selling every single day and they are trying to set themselves apart. Um, when you're advising people about how to be authoritative, but also warm and someone, as you said, that people enjoy being around and like talking to, what kind of things are you advising them to do? Well, you know, there's this famous line in, in this book. I mean, this play but, but that Alec Baldwin famously was in, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, when he talks about ABC, always be closing. And, and I, I, I've sort of modified that in my book saying ABC, always be connecting with people. And, and, and I think that if, if you really don't want to ever sell anybody anything, if you just know you have something of value to offer them, in your case, it's an amazing opportunity to, you know, get someone the best possible deal on a home purchase through the mortgage. And, and, and that's a real value. Like that could be a thousand dollars a month difference between somebody goes to one bank for another that could change someone's life over a 30 year period. So you have something of great value to offer them because of the network that you have. And so I think if you really just internalize that value that you have to offer someone and you try to solve someone else's problem and you take an interest in them and you engender that trust by really taking an interest in them and trying to solve their problem, you're going to get enough business. You don't have to sell anybody anything because once you connect with them, and they trust you, and they know that you can solve their problem. Why would they go anywhere else? And you don't have to sell them anything. It's and 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 I think that that's how do you do that? You do it by listening to someone. You do it by really asking them questions like, "What do you need here? Why are you buying this house? What interest rate do you want? Why do you choose 15 years over 30? Or whatever the right questions are." But once you delve into them, I think, and you have all that information because you've taken such a deep interest then you can easily solve their problem. Without all that information, you can't solve the problem as effectively. And so I think that warmth is really just a question of it's fact finding, it's listening, it's taking an interest. And um, and so I, I think it's quite simple if you really don't have an agenda. I mean, that's the irony of this whole thing. To be a great salesperson is to actually not have a sales agenda. And, and you might actually tell somebody along the way, look, you want this product, I'm not great at that. You should go somewhere else. And, and, and that's what a great salesman is, is to know like there's someone else and to know that your cup is going to run over too, because eventually you're going to get so much business that you can tell that customer, I'm not the right person for you. It's it's so it's so funny you mentioned that, Steve, because we we interviewed one of our, our clients, one of our mortgage broker clients recently. He said the same exact thing. You know, when he tells one of his clients, look, um, I'd love to help you out with this, but but to be honest with you, um, I don't think it's the right time for you to do what you're looking to do. People truly appreciate when you are honest with them. You know, even if it's not what they thought the conversation was going to go, how the conversation was going to go, they truly appreciate that when you're when you're genuine and they know that you're looking out for their best interest. So um, I, I just thought that was a really interesting connection. You know, you brought that up, and you know, one one other interesting thing about you, um, it, you know, and you represent all these you know broadcasters. Um, you you were never a broadcaster yourself. Um, you you know was was this. Was this always something that you wanted to do, you know, as you know, 
getting into representing, you know, sports broadcasters and um, th- this line of work. I mean, tell us, tell us how you sought out that path. No, it wasn't at all. Um, you know, people who know me from childhood would say, if they'd lost touch with me, they'd say, oh, that guy's probably writing for a newspaper somewhere in like, you know, God knows where. I, I went to uh, college to Michigan and worked on the Michigan Daily. I was a sports writer. And that's what I thought I wanted to do in my whole life. I had written as a sports editor in my high school newspaper. I wrote a local column in my town growing up in, in Long Island. And so that's what I wanted to do. And after two years at Michigan, I just realized that I did not want to be a sports writer. It, it really wasn't where my, my heart was anymore. And it was fortunate that I made that decision at the age of 20. And then I ended up going to law school almost by default. It was kind of the thing to do. And um, then after law school, I, I really didn't even know, to be honest with you, I wanted to be a sports agent representing, started representing basketball players. And I didn't even know there was such a thing as a media agent or, or, or a broadcasting agent. And if not for getting the opportunity to meet this guy, Art Kaminsky, who back in the day owned a big agency called Athletes and Artists, I didn't even know this was a job you could have. But then once I found that it was a job, it felt like it really played to my strengths. You know, I, I love media. I, I love, you know, I had a writing background. I did a little bit of on air, like in high school, really. But um, it, it just combined all the things I loved. You know, there's a little bit of legal involved in terms of negotiation and contract drafting and and, and, and reviewing. So it, it felt like it combined all the things I liked. And, just and, and let me... And let me jump on this because uh, I, I don't believe in luck. I believe luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And that leads me into my next question for you because it wasn't your wheelhouse, but yet you found a way to be successful at it. And for me, just listening, you had to work hard. I mean, you had to put in a lot of extra hours. You had to dig deep. You had to research. It's a lot went into you, you know, having the success you had. So can you just talk about, you know, as far as the work it took? Sure. to get you in the position that you are, you are now? Yes. So that's a great question. And I, I, I think it's it's funny, like you said, it wasn't my passion. It wasn't what I wanted, thought I wanted to do. But when I got into the field, what I really became obsessed with, and I think Justin can really appreciate this, is why is someone a good broadcaster? What makes a good voice? What makes good body language? What makes a good writer? What's a good package? You know, what's a good voiceover? What is it all? What are all the elements of it? And I think if you can just look at what the elements of all those things are, you can figure it out. It's like, you know, deconstructing anything requires what are its most basic parts? Like what makes a good zone defense? What makes good breaking a press? Like there are elements to all that that you can deconstruct. And so I went about studying this. I became obsessed with it. I read probably 50 books on all these topics. I met all these people that were experts in voice coaching, in media training, in, in theatrical background. I took classes at NYU in voice. In, 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 I did stand-up comedy. I did improv comedy. I did everything I could to learn about the performance aspect of it so I could coach other people doing it. And look, I'm, you probably have gathered this already. I have like a bit of OCD. Like when I get into <laughs> something, I go all in on it. And um, you know, my, my, a friend of mine makes fun of me, like, you know, one day I'm going to get into origami and you see me folding papers day and night, like, you know, but I, I just, I think if you're, if there's nothing on earth that if you get into it and want to learn about it, isn't interesting. Like I, I, Justin probably gathered this just from our conversation the other day. I'm like now really into mortgage brokering. I want to learn about your business. I think it's fascinating. I didn't even know it existed. What you guys did. I didn't even know that was a business until the other day. And now it's like so interesting to me. I've been reading up on your website and learning about what you do because it's just everything is interesting if you allow yourself to have curiosity. And and that is what drives me. Yeah, you know, you know, it's a great point. I mean, it seems like for you that that passion, you know, maybe it wasn't there from the start, but but you developed it because of that that curiosity uh, and that work that you put in to become successful. Um, You know, there's a difference, though, between, you know, saying to yourself, okay. I want to be a talent agent. I want it. This is what I want to do for a living. And then saying, okay, I'm going to own my own business because, you know, all of our entrepreneurs out there can appreciate this. You know, that is a, that's a leap to take, you know, when you're going to be a, a business owner, um, there's so much responsibility that comes with that. So, I mean, you mentioned the fact that, you know, it runs in the family, your, your siblings are all entrepreneurs as well. What is it about you or what was it about you that made you say to yourself, I'm going to start my own company and this is what I'm going to do. You know, there was no other choice, really. That's the funny thing about it. 
I, I was so frustrated throughout my entire twenties with the business world. And I just, I worked for three different people and I just really didn't frankly like any of them. Uh, I mean, I don't want to be too harsh, but I should say I didn't really like any of their business values of the three people. And it, it just was, I, I thought like, well, I can go the rest of my life complaining about everybody. Or if I just think everyone's doing it wrong, why don't you just go do it right? Then you have to take a chance. And I was very lucky. I was turning 30. I didn't have, I wasn't married, no kids at the time, really no responsibilities financially. I'd saved up some money. My parents lent me a little bit of money and, um, and I just hung out a shingle basically and rented office space in my brother's law firm downtown. And, you know, I think it's just, if I remember my mother saying to me one time, like early on in the business, she said, well, don't worry if it doesn't work, you can come back and move into your bedroom and you can go back to practicing law. And I remember thinking, that's not an option. I could never do that. I'd be so miserable doing that, that it was like I was walking across the high wire and my mother thought she was putting a net under me, but she wasn't like I, there was no net. And it's, that's a good thing, by the way, I'm not saying that to show any bravery. It's a good thing. If you can't look down and you can't look back and you have to only look forward, nothing seems that difficult because you know, you are committed to that goal. And it took me a long time before the business really got going, like probably four or five years, but that's okay. Cause I was just focused on that goal and there was no way I was quitting. There was no way I was giving up. It didn't matter how lean some of the years were. I'm going to keep going here. And, and that, that was the mindset. It's, it's so funny you say that. <clears throat> and I'm not saying giving this story uh, to pat myself on the back, but I remember at Michigan state, we had to stand up our freshman year and say, what our major was and you know what our career goals was. And, you know, I said, you know, my major is elementary education, but I'm not here for that. I'm here to go to the NBA. And I think a lot of people took that the wrong way, you know, arrogant athlete, you know, but to be honest, I was just super focused on uh, what I wanted to do. I had a goal as a kid to be an NBA basketball player. And, and, and it goes to like, you know, my mother's like, you know, you can do whatever you put your mind to it. And she always pumps self-confidence in me. But it, it, you, you telling that story, Steve, just reminded me, you know, I would say, yeah, I'm here to be a school teacher. And, you know, if that comes, oh, well. But I am here to go to the NBA. There's no plan B. Not, I want to go to the NBA. And it's, I'm not saying that arrogant. That's just what I'm, what I'm going to do. <laughs> you know, and right, I think right. my head came across wrong to some people, but I think go-getters and, you know, people, they understood exactly what I was talking about. Yeah, and you achieved that goal because, look, I, I, I sometimes, you know, say that, I don't know if you follow horse racing or not, but sometimes with the horses, they, they put these blinkers on them to block out their vision from all they can do is see straight ahead of them because a lot of horses are moving that way. And I, I like to think of myself that way, like a horse that wants to just put these blinkers on like you did <laughs> right there in front of you. It's far down the road. Maybe it's three or four years away, but there's the NBA. That's the finish line. And that's OK. And look, even if you didn't make it to the NBA, your mindset was still the right one. Yes. No, you you guys are right. I mean, th having having that one and only plan, the no plan B mentality, um, it, it does. It gives you that mindset that you're going to achieve your goal no matter what. For me, it was similar. You know, I went to Syracuse, studied broadcast journalism, decided I was going to be a sports broadcaster. That was all I wanted to do. I didn't I didn't have a double major. Um, I didn't have a minor that I was, you know, considering as far as a career path went. I wanted to be a sports broadcaster and I did it. Um, so I, yep. I think, you know, it, it's, it's a good point, you know, don't, don't set yourself up for failure by saying, here's my plan B. Uh, but, but well, the Steve, problem you know, is, if I can just jump in real quick. Yeah, go ahead. The problem, with, the problem with plan B, I mean, I think in some cases, plan B is fine. I, I, I have no problem with plan B in some cases, but I think for some people, plan B is an excuse and plan B is a, uh, is, is a, is a safety valve and they're too quick to pull that hatch when they get discouraged or disappointed. That's what I have a problem with plan B. And like, you know, a guy like Mateen, maybe he gets benched as a freshman. Maybe he gets beaten, you know, in a game that he shouldn't have lost to a guy who's not as good as him. And maybe the coach yells at him. And maybe because he's got this other plan to become a teacher, he's like, well, screw this. Like, I can't take this, the pressure here and the yelled at and, and the disappointments. So I'm just gonna become a teacher. That's gonna be easier. And if you really want plan A, you gotta block plan B out, I, I think. Good point. So I, I want you, Steve, I want you to tell the story now. So you, you're, you're a successful talent agent. Um, you know, you, you've got your business, you, you've got clients who have been with you for a long time. 
And, and then at a certain point in your career, you also decide to become this career advisor. Um, how, how did that all transpire? Um, and then also, how did that kind of translate into you writing this book? So, you know, it's like everything else, I think, in life. I know Mateen will disagree with this, but I think it sort of involves a little bit of, or a lot of luck um, <laughs> and, and a bit of a fluke. You know, I, I think I, I have a lot of existential angst, you know, like probably a lot of people. And I want to feel like I'm doing something for the world. And it makes me feel like if I'm not useful then what am i doing here and like my wife will make fun of me I, I can't just sit still it's not in my nature and um so i think what what happened was is five years ago i was turning 50 i'm gonna be 55 this july i i just kind of realized like well okay this is a big milestone in my life what am i going to do for the rest of my life am i going to just be an agent and, and is that it and it felt like that wasn't enough it felt like there was something else i could do and i said well what else could i contribute where's my value and um I thought, okay, well, I've learned a lot about communication. I really think I understand this immensely. And I think I really have a, a particular angle on this that's new and unusual and can be helpful to a lot of people. And so I thought, all right, why can't the things that I have taught broadcasters be useful to doctors and lawyers and teachers and everybody along the way? And so I just started to put down some of these ideas uh, basically in, in a PowerPoint. And I mentioned this to a friend of ours whose daughter was friends with my son, believe it or not, in the second grade, because I said, said this was five years ago. And the, the, my daughter was in the choir in school and we went to go hear her sing. And I mentioned it to this woman who was a friend and shockingly, she said, I love this idea. This is a great idea. You, you should come work at my, my bank. We, we, we could use someone like you as a consultant. And I said, oh, great. So she introduced me to the head of HR for this major bank. And next thing you know, they hired me. And then I got hired by um, a big law firm and then a medical company. And then, you know, one day I was giving a speech at this bank and this woman got up and said, I love what you're saying here. You know, I have two kids, 18 and 20. Can I buy two copies of your book today for my kids? And I said, what book? I don't have a book. And she said, well, that's a real, that's a real shame because you've got a really good idea here. And I think a lot of people should read this. You should write a book. So it's March 8th, 2017. I came home. I told my wife and she said, well, you, you should write a book. And I, I literally took those notes and crafted them into a, um, into a, uh, like a, a book proposal. I found an agent because I'm not a literary agent. And the next thing you know, like we had a bidding war for the book and, and Harper Collins bought the book. It was crazy. Like life never works out that way. And, and then, of course, my, my good luck kind of came to a crashing halt because after all of this good luck, the book gets published right in the middle of COVID. So the gods were, we had the last laugh here. <laughs> I, I, I love that story. I, I love your message. We're, we're, we're gonna, how can I get a couple copies of your book? Uh, I don't have a book. <laughs> That was it, right? Oh, yeah. That was that 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 was crazy, man. And 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 like like now, far as your confidence now, because you're you're meeting with some heavy hitters here, and I either say you got to be confident or crazy, like just don't care, you know? Because I I've been in situations like that where I've had to sit with some big time people, and I'm I'm sitting there like, oh man, they like they're really taking my advice, you know, and, and I got more confident as I you went forward. But for you, was it kind of like you meet, you're dealing with certain successful people and it's like, did you look at them, you know, their position or you was like, oh, this is just a regular Joe. I'm just here to do my job. So how, what was your mind frame and your approach to that? I, I tell you, I remember the very first big negotiation I had was at HBO Sports. And I, I went in the first day, it was right when I started the business and I wore a suit and I met with this head of HR for this, this company. And I was scared to death, scared out of my mind. And I was so insecure and feeling of inferiority. And how was I gonna talk to this person? And I remember the next negotiation I did was for this local anchor in New York. And I literally got down on my hands and knees and begged this guy, um, his name was Steve Paulus to give this client $100,000 and um, so I, I started off with, with a tremendous sense of insecurity and inferiority about it. But, you know, something clicked for me along the way. It wasn't so much that I got so confident. It was that I kind of realized that everybody's insecure and everybody's vulnerable and we're all mortals. And once I kind of thought 
everybody's gone through the same feelings you have. They may not just show it the way you're willing to show it, but they all have it. And if you can just tap into that and get them to open up a little bit and take off their kind of mask, if you will, just by being sincere, then you could, you could really have a, a relationship with them one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, now obviously this is 20 plus years later, but in, in, in writing this book, I had the chance to speak to 107 different people um, from all walks of life, many, many very successful uh, executives and, and business people, including Ken Langone, who is the, uh, the founder of Home Depot and this big hospital in New York, NYU, Lang it's called Langone NYU, he's a billionaire. And we sat in his office for two hours and I just felt like we were the same person. Like we were just, we were equals because, because in some way we are equals and, and I might run across a homeless guy on the street tonight and he and I are equals. We're both vulnerable. We both got the same mortality issues. And once you realize that, then it's all very easy, I think, to relate to people. What, what is your advice, Steve, for, for people who are just starting out in, in their businesses? You know, because a lot of our, our clients, you know, the, the big struggle is not starting a business, but making the business successful. You know, it's like getting that business off the ground um, and, and, you know, it kind of ties back to, to the relationships conversation when it comes to referrals, because, you know, one of our guests, actually, another one of our clients said, focus on a couple of people, treat them really, really well, and just watch the referrals start to flow in. What, what advice do you give people when it, when it comes to that, about how you start to build a client base, especially when your business is relatively new? Well, first of all, I think you have to have reasonable expectations about the timing in which things can be done. And you can't expect to have a huge business in a short period of time because you're not going to be building it on a solid foundation. So that's one thing. The second thing I think is truly, truly solve other people's problems, care about them. If it's applicable in your business, then take an interest in the totality of their lives, even if it has nothing to do with their business. Like, let's say you were a mortgage broker for someone and it turned out that they need a, um, a trust and estates lawyer. Now you might run across those kinds of people in your life and you may not benefit from it, but if you give that name to someone and they do a good job, they're going to trust you. Maybe they need an accountant. Maybe you know an accountant now. Maybe they need a lawyer. So like, I think that's what we do well in the agency is that if our clients have anything that they need, we're going to solve that problem for them. We're going to get them to the right person. And they know that they just pick up the phone and call us no matter what it is. Could be a doctor in Texas. We'll find them a good doctor in Texas for some crazy ailment they might have. Um, and, and, and I think that gives them a real sense of like, hey, these guys really do care about, because we do care about them. And I, I just think you can't turn that on and off. It's, I just go back to this one last time about Tom Izzo and the team. Like if, if, if you coach someone and you feel that sense of kinship and frankly love for them. I'm sure he loves you, Mateen. Like he's not gonna turn that off. And, and it's a very great feeling to have that sense of caring for someone else. And um, if, if you really do, I think have the right mindset, you can solve everybody's problem. And when you do that, you're gonna make a lot of money and you're gonna have a great business, but you're not gonna be agenda driven. I like that. I definitely love that approach. And uh, let me piggyback on with this question because Justin talked about you know, building a client base. Uh, and you mentioned you got, you know, some, some team members that's been with you over 15, 20 years, 25 years. Now, building a team, because I know a lot of new entrepreneurs, they want to do everything themselves. You know, I'm going to do it myself because I'm, I'm, I want to do it the right way. And they like run their self ragged at times because they're trying to do everything themselves and they're not trusting in others uh, or, or, or it hasn't clicked to them to let me go out and get in someone else that's better at that job function because I'm not that good at that. I'm good at this, but I'm not good at that. Um, can you talk a little bit about building a team? Um, in, yes. A good yeah. team it's around. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic question. And I think it's the, it's, the, it's the root of all bad businesses and the root of all good businesses is this ability to trust other people and to delegate and to give other people a sense of empowerment. And at the end of the day, you know, I think that it, it, my wife makes fun of me. She says, like, I'm the greatest delegator ever. I've delegated all the parenting to her. Um, <laughs> it's probably, you know, somewhat true. But in, in, in our business, for example, like, I'm terrible with math and with numbers. So we've had the same accountant CFO for all 25 years. And we've, I've had the same lawyer for the 25 years of been in business. And I think if you find great people and you give them a sense of uh, ownership in what they do, they're going to do a great job. 
and they're going to take ownership in it and treat the company as if it's their own. And ultimately, you know, it's, it comes down to humility, really. It's like, I, I know I'm not like, I'm good at one thing, which is building and developing and maintaining relationships. Everything else I'm not that great at. And so like for me to pretend that I'm the greatest lawyer, it's ridiculous. I'm the greatest accountant, terrible. So I think you have to be humble about it and let other people do their jobs. And, and, and nobody wants to be micromanaged, nobody. And so I think that's really important in terms of building. And I think that's why I've had the kind of loyalty I've had because I don't micromanage the people that work for me. I, they, I treat them as partners and full on, like, this is your lane. You, you do with it what you want. If you need something, come and ask me, but I'm not going to hover over you. I, it's a great point. And to me, you know what it says about you? That you're self-aware. You know, you know what your strengths are. You're able to sit down and have an honest conversation with, about, you know, with yourself about what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. And then you build your business accordingly. And I think that's a great piece of advice for any of our listeners out there, you know, especially when you're starting out, figure out what you're good at, where you can best direct your efforts in terms of, you know, playing to your strengths, so to speak, and then fill in the gaps by bringing in other people to kind of address the things that you're not as good at. I think I wanted to say one thing about being self-aware. I think it's a really important point is that, I think you, you have to find the right relationships in your life for people that are going to just give it to you when you deserve it. And you have to be willing to take it. You know, like, again, my wife, she kills me and rightfully so when I deserve it, my kids make fun of me. You know, I have a lot of friends from childhood. They, they don't give a crap that I wrote a book. All they do is make fun of me for having written a book. You know, they, they, they don't care about my success. I mean, I'm sure they're very happy for me, but they're not going to not needle me. And um, those are the kinds of people I think you need in your life, you know, going to keep you honest and keep you, keep you, you know, continuing to make fun of yourself because you're not that great. Yeah. I'm the youngest of, I was the youngest of four boys. So I went through a lot of that. You know, my brother's <laughs> telling me good game, but you're not that great. Keep working hard. You know, you got a lot of work to do and it helped me a lot, you know, in my life. Yeah, I'm the youngest of three boys. I may have a younger sister too, but I took a lot of shit from them and all their <laughs> friends. So it's good for you. I think it's good for the soul. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, no, it, it reminded me too, like you were talking about your wife. Um, you know, when I was on TV, uh, you know, most of the time, if I if I came home and, and asked her if she watched the show or watched the post game show, she didn't even know it was on or know what time it was on. You know, she just <laughs> it was never even on her radar. So it kind of you know it kind of kept me level. Not that I you know I was never really into the whole being on TV thing. I I did it because I loved it. It was what I genuinely enjoyed doing. Um, you know, Steve. I mean, I'm sure you you've dealt with plenty of people right. who just love being on TV because it's an ego boost. But um, yeah, right. for for me, it was always just you know something I love to do. But you know, an, another good point. Um. It's, it's been a great conversation. Um, it's, it's been fascinating just kind of listening to you and talking about your career. And, and now, um, you know, with the book and, and advising people, um, tell, tell our listeners before we let you go, you know, how they can get in touch with you if they're interested in, in working with you. And also if they're, uh, if they're looking to buy your book. Sure. Well, um, I have a website. It's just www.stevenhers.com, S-T-E-V-N-H-E-R-Z.com. And on that website, you can, there's a click, you can click on a link to get the book on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, or um, you can always go to your local bookstore. And you can also follow me if you want on, you know, all these social media channels, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. And, you know, I've, I've become very uh, social media savvy in the last year, um, but I'm not on TikTok yet. Maybe one day, but <laughs> not quite. My kids will make fun of me if I do that. So, um, but it's, it's, it's been a fun, it's been a fun journey. I have to say it's been, um, I've had a good life and the last year has been really fun and it's fun talking to people like you and it's, it's cathartic and it's, it's a lot of philosophy. You know, I, I think it's a good philosophy for living. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and even like, you know, just to kind of tie it all together back to the way we started off the episode talking about, you know, surrounding yourself with critics, it seems like, you know, your, your wife and your kids, you know, they, they help, you know, they kind of fit that, that role as well, you know, like, not that you designed it that way, but uh, it's just good to have those people in your life who can, you know, give you criticism. Um, and, and again, to the, to the point we were talking about earlier, telling you uh, what you need to hear instead of telling you what you want to hear. So, um, Steve, you stated. yeah, we, we appreciate the time. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, guys. It was great to talk to you. <laughs>